Good evening, Good evening and a very warm welcome to this seminar hosted by the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies. Although the IMLR's name has been changed to the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies, please rest assured that the seminars and bookings will continue in the usual format. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Till Greta, who is a visiting fellow at the Institute earlier this year. He is currently a research assistant at the Humboldt University in Berlin, where he recently completed his doctorate. He has held a fellowship at Princeton University and his edition of Wilhelm Speer's 1947 text, Das Glück der Andermacht, is due in May 2023. But the topic tonight is Michael Hamburger and the No Man's Land of Languages. Thank you very much, Till. Thank you, Jana, uh, for your kind introduction. And also thanks to the Center for German and Austrian Expert Studies for giving me actually the opportunity to present some of my first uh, results from my research stay in London earlier this year. That was uh, generously funded by the Martin uh, Miller and Hannah Norbert Miller Trust. So my presentation will take approximately, I think, 45 minutes. And I hope that will be some time left to talk and discuss, of course. So before I delve into the research I've conducted on the Berlin-born British poet, translator and critic, Michael Hamburger, allow me to begin in medias res with a small description of three revealing portraits of the author at different stages of his life. These images may provide a first impression of the destiny of this still under-recognized British German writer of the 20th century. The first image, center, shows Hamburger at the end of his life in the late 1990s on the bank of the Wannsee, a lake in the southwest of the German capital. In the background, we see the literary colloquium, an institution in Berlin founded after the war, which in its early years tried to invite and bring exiled ex-Berliners back to their hometown and encourage them to write about the city. We recognize on Hamburg's face here a melancholic and even mourning gaze. We do not see where his eyes go, but it is likely that they crossed the water to fix a point on the other side of the lake. In a poem called Meeting, dedicated to his friend, the East Berlin poet, Johannes Bobrowski, he once described a similar constellation. Here I was born, one can read in his poem from 1962, back in the murdered years. Neither here nor there I'm at home, on my way in search of the place. This is the first of a number of Hamburger's self-descriptions as a homeless wanderer between worlds. But where, in our case, does the poet's view go? The second image to the left of my small selection may give an answer. This early portrait taken from the book Max Gain, his autobiography, shows him at the age of eight and the costume of a young Faust apparently in a parody of Goethe's famous tragedy. For those of you familiar with the topography of Berlin, you may know the district of Clado, where the picture was taken, on the, other, on the opposite side of the Wannsee. To speak with a cinematic term, the second picture is the counter shot to the first image. For Hamburger, Clado was an ambivalent place, it was the idyllic home of his grandparents that inspired some of his later poems. But it was also the uncanny site from whence his parents in 1933 organized their escape from Nazi Germany to Britain. In that respect, it was the place of unspoken anxieties 
It may be a co coincidence, but it is a meaningful one that this side of the lake was also the venue of the Vanzi conference, where the horror was planned. Words cannot reach him, Hamburger later wrote in his poem, In a Cold Season, in his prisons of words, whose words killed men, women and children whom to him were numbers. And this horror, horror of the Holocaust remained uh, a long life issue for Hamburger. The third and last image to the right depicts him after the war in the mid 1950s on the occasion of one of his returns to his former hometown. The photo was taken by the Berlin-based photographer Fritz Eschen, who was similarly a survivor of the Holocaust. Hamburger's gaze here is turned towards the left, in a certain way looking backwards in time. The entire scenery seems to have an existential atmosphere. Later, Hamburger admitted that during these stays in Berlin, immediately after the war, he was hit by what he called his shock of recognition. At that point, he had to cope with a traumatic sense of foreignness. Now a British citizen and young Oxford educated intellectual, coming back to his ruined hometown, he felt like a stranger as he wrote in his memoir, walking through the rubble and empty spaces, jumbled fragments of his Berlin childhood. So this shock of recognition, as he remarked in a letter that I discovered during my research stay in London, belonged to this earlier period in which he tried to find his surviving relatives in an entirely changed world. At this moment, he grasped what had transpired during the years since he had left his homeland. I choose these three images for my introductory comment because I had the impression that through them, we see in a nutshell, Hamburger's fundamental sense of being caught between two worlds. Let me now take a step back and give you a brief outline of my research project entitled Michael Hamburger and the no man's land of languages towards the phenomenology of exile which I, which I started this summer during my stay as a Martin Miller and Hannah Norbert Miller visiting scholar at the Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies. Its initial idea, however, goes back to my doctoral thesis, The Empty Center, Berlin, an image of literary post-war Germany, completed earlier this year, in which I tried to develop a new perspective of our understanding of German literature after the war by including the underappreciated issue of literary exile after 1945, actually. In my thesis about the cold crater of post-war Berlin, I took a close look on those, those authors who, drawing on an expression by Wolfgang Köppen, belonged to a so-called lost generation. Here I examined both authors, those in exile and those belonging to the inner immigration who, like Oskar Lerke or Peter Huchel, remained in Germany during the Nazi era. Both authors, actually, that later attracted the interest of the critic and translator Michael Hamburger. The last chapter of my dissertation was dedicated to an author whose work and life expressed for me the entire complexity of Berlin as an allegorical side of recent history and that respect of long unresolved pain and traumatic re-encounters. The author I'm talking about is of course Michael Hamburg again, who fled after the Nazi takeover at the age of nine to the UK. He belonged to the group of youngest refugees who arrived in Britain after being expelled by the Nazis due to his Jewish background, even though he had the luck in contrast to the children of the kinder transport to migrate with his closer family. And here I think it is worth mentioning that Hamburger, as he later explained, was not aware of having a Jewish background before the Nazis came into power. 
This circumstance was not uncommon among assimilated Jewish middle-class families in Germany and in the biggest cities like Berlin in particular at the time. In his essay, Gedanken zur Identitätsfrage, thoughts about the question of identity, he came back to this issue saying that he grew up outside the Jewish community. However, the, enforced, the forced transplantation to Britain confronted him with the problem of belonging and identity. His answer to that issue is therefore characteristic for Hamburger, who choose first and foremost the identity of a poet without neglecting the fact that his imposed displacement made him one. So for him, the identity of a poet has to be searched in his artistic work, not in inscriptions secondary to his preoccupations. Uh, now you see the, the English translation uh, in, the, in this slide. The Identität eines Dichters, he wrote in the German essay, ergibt sich aus dem, was er geschrieben hat, nicht aus dem, was er wollte, sondern aus dem, was er musste und konnte. I will come back to this issue of the urgency of Hamburg's poetry when talking about the concept of a no man's land of languages. So taking into account this urgency of poetic expression, it might be astonishing to hear that Hamburger's career did not start with his own literary work, but with a translation. In a manuscript that I discovered during my research, he commented on this memorable and curious beginning. His first publication was a book of translated poems by the German poet Friedrich Hölderlin, presumably the only poet who accompanied him throughout his entire life as a writer. The book appeared in 1943, published by a 19 years old immigre, just graduated from Westminster School, now serving as a soldier in the British army to fight against his native country. In his text, Hamburger tells this anecdote not only to highlight the unlikely, almost surreal event of his birth as an author, but also to make a statement about his host country, Britain, about its decency that, that rescued him from being persecuted by the Nazi regime. Serving in the British Army, he received an invitation by the Poetry Society in London to deliver, to deliver a speech on his Hölderlin translations, giving this as an example for the seriousness about the reception of literature and even German in these years. And ironically, it was his Sergeant Major who encouraged the young Hamburger to represent the entire regiment with his work on Hölderlin. In retrospect, he concluded in the manuscript from the 1980s, it was a wonderful thing to talk about a German poet in the middle of the war. This strange occasion was so typical for all the things that were really good in England at that time, many of which I'm sorry to say have gone. So this is also a critical reference here to the diminishing impact thing of literature in the UK after what Hamburger called the golden age of poetry till the 1960s. There is in addition a second element in this Hölderlin anecdote from his first decade in British exile. In these years in which the young Hamburger had to assimilate to a new language and a different mentality, Hölderlin served for him as a preponderant figure of identification. Of course, it was not the partly by the Nazis misused nationalistic interpretation of the poet. On the contrary, the hurdling he emphasized was to use an expression by the poet himself, the Dichter in Dürftiger Zeit, or as Hamburger translated, the poet in desolate times. So 20 years, some 20 years later, he described the poetry of his friend and Hölderlin admirer Bobrovsky in a similar way by saying he was deeply involved in the issues and disasters of our time. 
Exactly for that reason, the poet in his eyes is always urged to be a witness and to develop, to, and to develop a capacity, as he wrote, to span great distances, geographical, temporal, and cultural. My assumption is that this is at the same time a good description of what, of what Hamburger understood under the poet's task. This implies a rather uneasy position. Hamburger remained even in later years in an outcast's position, a restless mind who, to quote his translation from 1943 again, from land to land used to travel. Therefore, I would argue that we can understand Hölderlin's vision as an allegory for the imagery Hamburger had in mind, existing between lands and languages. For him, this was the vulnerable figure with a particular responsiveness. In short, a seismographic figure in Tillmanter's times. When we look at Hamburger's engagement with the literary life of the UK at this critical point, it is no coincidence that after the war, he became a crucial mediator, mediating between the German language literature in the English speaking world. I recently found a good characteri characterization of this group of cultural mediators Hamburger supposedly belonged to. It was the German romantic writer Jean Paul who, in his introduction to aesthetics, described a certain type of writers essential to our literary tradition he called Bindegeister, Bindegeister. You can translate this as connecting or mediating spirits. These spirits, according to Jean Paul, operate not only between nations and languages, but also between different times. The work of these spirits brings times and cultures together, aware of the fact that this work always includes two sides, connecting one shore with another. There's evidence that Hamburger saw himself in a similar position, trying to reconnect, as he describes the task in his book, After the Second Flood, the pre with the post-war era. This implied a bridging the eras without denying the deathly distance in between the break of Nazism marked. In his magnum opus, The Truth of Poetry, Hamburger coined the post-1945 era a period loose at all ends, one that nevertheless challenged him to bring some of these ends in relation, especially in his work as a translator, which ranged from Hölderlin to Paul Celan as his contemporary. He played a decisive role in familiarizing the English-speaking world with elements in Germany's literary tradition. He shouldered this task at a point in history the survival of this legacy was at stake due to totalitarian regimes trying to manipulate or eradicate this tradition. In that respect, his engagement was also against the current and untimely undertaking. But thanks to Hamburger, a good deal of German literature finally settled in the UK. As a translator, as well as a critic, he helped, according to Jeremy Adler, to acclimatize foreign poetry in the English language. He lent a voice to many German poets whom we now recognize as key authors, giving them, as Allah formulated it, a local habitation and a name in the English world. But Hamburger, even more astonishing, established this approach of bridging both ways. I write critical things, he once stated, about German literature, which to German readers seems to be written from a foreign point of view. Its fruitfulness came from the outsider's point of view, but with the insight of the former insider. It was the perspective of the exile who felt the need to keep in touch with his background by, build, by building his own arc of German literature. As the titles of his critical writings indicate, for example, a proliferation of prophets or after the second flood, Hamburger was driven by an extraordinary historical awareness and ethical commitment to the destiny 
of recent German literature. In the latter book, he built on the assumption that the dispersion of German literature during the Third Reich was followed by other dispersions due to the division of Germany, the loss of its Eastern territories, but also the self-exile, the self-imposed exile of many authors after the war. To come to terms with the altered situation, Hamburger characterized the German literature of his period as undergoing a painful age of this passion, which left behind not only a feeling of uncertainty, but an intellectual vacuum. In that respect, he used the term to describe the radically changed historical and sociological circumstances that sponsored newly emerging modes of, of writing, including forms of hermetic poetry, forms of compression, and minimal poetry. He called these forms of literature one of displaced pasts. And indeed, many German poets who began to write in the aftermath of the war, for instance, Paul Celan, Nelly Sachs, or Johannes Bobrovsky, and all of whom Hamburger translated actually, under one underwent the traumatic experience of displacement. Here we approach the crucial problem of my research project linked to the notion of a no man's land between languages that intertwines Hamburger's historical interests regarding the literature post 1945 with his own experience as a witness of terror, expulsion and dispersion. Moreover, here we understand why Hamburger had a well-justified reserve against the German branch of exile studies, of exil forschung, that in his view failed to recognize the important contributions to literature being made beyond the years of 1933 to 1945, the classical period of exile studies. He secondly confronted them with a shortcoming which was his very personal concern, the problem of language. Unlike writers of the early exile, like Thomas Mann or Alfred Dublin, who were accompl accomplished and well recognized with their own style of writing at the time of their expulsion, the aforementioned authors, Hamburger described as displaced poets, were confronted with a different problem of expression. They had to deal with what he identified as a Sprachunsicherheit, an existential uncertainty of language deriving from an earlier and forced displacement. So all the writers belonging to this second wave shared, following to Hamburger, a radical approach towards language as a fragile medium that cannot be taken for granted anymore. At this point, we hit on the intimate experience of his own crossing to Britain and how this cut changed his attitude towards language forever. During my archival work at the British Library, I stumbled on a remarkable oral statement by him, which he made on the occasion of a poetry reading in Cambridge. Therein, he commented on the moment of his border crossing. If you are taking out the language, which was your very first language, and then you grew up in another language, it could be that you begin to see language as, as something that you can't take for granted in the, way that, in the way that most people do take language for granted. Something that you're moving in as your element, as a fish moves in water. As though the fish has been taken out of water full time and then put in a different tank. And then the fish begins to see there is such a thing as water. Whereas before that he wasn't aware that he moved in water at all. The displaced fish here begins to see the water, which means the language. For Hamburger, this was at the same moment, at least in retrospect, his birth as a poet and translator in exile. What I would like to underline here is, as Hamburger called in his essay, Einige Bemerkungen zur Kategorie Exilliteratur, some remarks on the category of exile literature, a sprach problematic characteristic of exile, a unique condition of uncertainty. He later related this shocking experience, which one must call trauma, 
with the more general tangents and states of discourse he identified as a productive dilemma. Every poet has to tackle a concept that is at the core of his most scholarly book, The Truth of Poetry. Poetry. Drawing on the romantic writer John Keats' conception of the poet's negative capability, Hamburger put forward the idea that the poet possesses a distinctive capacity to deal with uneasy conditions better than others, with ambiguities, uncertainties, issues of identity. In short, he claimed that we have to look at all our, at these tensions, quarrels with himself, he wrote, out of which a poet makes poetry. But not only that, for him, the flip side of this poet's negative capability was, in the case of those authors he admired, a gift of empathy that helped them to find words, images, for the all too human experiences, including shame and fallibility, that we do not have words yet. Because poems know better, even better than its author, according to him, they may help others to get in touch with their own quarrels with themselves. My assumption now regarding Hamburg's concept of a birth of poetry from the spirit of contradiction is that it is deeply bound up with his own experience of exile, of his Übersetzung, as he once said, expressing through this pun his experience of being translated and transposed at the same time. Surely he was not the only one who went through this particular problem of language, confronted with a new barrier, but also trying to make his bilingualism productive in a new environment. As Anthony Grenwell argued in his book on Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria, this experience was in a way typical for a second generation of refugees. They stand, as he wrote, awkwardly between the generation of the parents, which still followed continental habits, and a completely anglicized generation born in Britain. They too were mostly bilingual, but did not undergo the same rupture from the first language as the middle generation. Many of the latter group felt throughout their lives a sense of discomfort, being caught midway between British and German cultures, not being firmly rooted in either camp, as Granwell remarked. This sense of division, living between a native and an adoptive language, to mention this briefly, was verbalized by other writers of Hamburger's generation too. A comparison, I think, of their production could be a fruitful uh, project. An impressive example to the poem is the poem Bilingual by Lotte Kramer, originally from Mainz, born in 1923, a year earlier than Hamburger. She came to Britain with one of the last kinder transports. In her poem, she expresses the dilemma of her generation in a crystallized form, a minimal poetry in Hamburger's sense. Myself, I'm unsure in both languages, one with mothering genes, at once close and foreign, after much unuse, near in poetry, the other, a constant love affair, still unfulfilled, a warm shoulder to touch. In Hamburger's writing, this paradigmatic position between two cultural and linguistic patterns can easily be detected. As mentioned, he later described himself foreign to the German culture. However, also in his English poetry, as Charlie Luth wrote in an article entitled The Traveler, his work was regarded as unfamiliar. He recognized in Hamburger's poetry a certain ex-territorial tone and movement. This is true when we take into account how important Herderlin's forms, his odes and shorter epigrams, were for Hamburger's development as a poet. And this is also why this uneasy position of writing in between two patterns caused serious frustrations and disappointment. In the year of his death, in 2007, he complained in a letter to a friend that some critics in Britain still labeled him as a German author, doing so 
after he published poems in his adopted language for more than half a century. The paradoxical ability which Hamburger regarded as characteristic for the displaced poet was of course not unfamiliar to him. Already in one of his first poems after the war, he identified himself with the so-called deep peace, the displaced people, persons of Europe. And he chose the alter ego of the European tram to give his state of mind a name and a body. Apparently he truly felt, felt truly at home only in what he called his, in his German writings about, about his ruined, divided hometown Berlin and no man's land between languages. And it was at a temporary return to his place of birth in the early 1960s that led him to develop his broader poetics of a Niemann's land, a no man's land, or better yet, a nobody's land belonging to no one. Here he discovered a linguistic interstice, a rift in between that served him as a point of departure for new forms of expression. This idea occurred during a critical period of his writing when he tried to overcome his earlier role, his earlier works still dominated by literary role models. But to start a new phase, Hamburger felt it necessary to return to a zero degree of his life. And this coincided with a re-encounter with his hometown. This is a Berlin experience he sketched out in his German essays published in 1966 under the title Zwischen den Sprachen, Between the Languages, as follows. Mein Niemandsland, Zwischen den Sprachen, he wrote in his No Man's Land Variations, konnte eigentlich nur ein Land des Schweigens und der Nacktheit sein. Both keywords here, silent, between space, a land of silence in Berlin, the author's feeling of nakedness or unsheltered sensibility are essential to his discovery of a rift between English and German. So this moment also signifies a return to his experience of exile. Here, however, he regarded it as an opportunity to renew his poetic sensibility as he put it in his essay, Hölderlin in England, to awake the poet's naked thinking heart within. In his case, it meant a return to a resource buried inside him, the German of his Berlin childhood. Out of this linguistic no man's land position, Hamburger finally embarked in the 1960s to a remarkable productive period of bilingual poetry and essay writing. He began to develop a new language that started for him as a stammer, a stammering between the languages. This once again hit him like a second shock, this time in addition affecting his attitude towards the adopted English language. Erschreckend war das. He wrote about his return to bilingualism after a period of neglecting his mother tongue, weil ich die Zweisprachigkeit weder vorausgesehen noch erwünscht hatte, weil ich nun auch in meinen englischen Gedichten noch einmal emigrieren musste, diesmal in ein Niemandsland. Here we see that Hamburger consciously cultivated this ex-territorial tone. And we can add that after the Berlin encounter it was a real decision in his poetic development, culminating in a series of poems, traveling, he began in the end or by the end of the 1960s. To avoid a misunderstanding of Hamburger's relation of bilingualism, however, I would like to introduce a distinction he suggests in his critical writings. Being bilingual did not only, did not imply for Hamburger only successful mastery of both languages. Rather, he considered this form of experience between two languages, the result of a crisis at Zerbüttung, he wrote in German, that may be best translated as perturbation or as a split of mind underlying, underlining the psychological turmoil involved. In between the languages, Hamburger distinguished his own problematic relationship to language as distinct from common Zweisprachigkeit or bilingualism, as when, for instance, a child grows up speaking two languages. Hamburger's language problem 
more strongly resembles a Doppelsprachigkeit, a cut in between, deriving from a traumatic event. So what means Doppelsprachigkeit here, fo focusing on its supposed duality? There is another exiled author who made a similar experience, a writer almost of same age as Hamburger. I have in mind the French-German writer and translator Georges Arthur Goldschmidt. He once described Doppelsprachigkeit as a condition a person went through who has assimilated at an early age to a foreign language and culture. Doppelsprachigkeit in contrast to Zweisprachigkeit or bilingualism is aus der Geschichte entstanden, he wrote. Sie ist ein persönliches Schicksal. Sie ist zu jeder Lebenszeit eine verdoppelte Seinserfahrung. Sie lässt einen nie in Ruhe und verlangt jedes Mal eine fast leibliche Umstellung. Even though Hamburger did not use the term Goldschmidt coined here, he was nevertheless aware of the strange experience of a double or split approach to reality. In an essay on the bilingual Samuel Beckett, Hamburger made his personal confession to this issue. To be bilingual for a writer, he stated, is not an accomplishment, but an affliction, amounting to little less than a state of schizophrenia. In his explanation, he, he relates this affliction to the fact of being exiled that caused its own poetics of silence, reduction, and smallness. So here again, we have the features of a style of writing he discovered during his period in Berlin's wastelands. To conclude, this no man's land experience, which is also at the heart of my project, one can say, for Hamburger at stake, was at this turning point, a departure towards a new poetic expression for the first time in both languages, in which he tried to be fully aware of the poet's destiny in an age of dispersion. Therefore, I would like to argue that we can read his remarks on German poetry in British exile as a subtext to his own literary production. Particularly in his essay, Some Remarks on the Category of Exile Literature, he headed it towards a peculiar adventure, a vagueness of writing in exile. This adventure brought about a productive tension between the feeling of foreignness and freedom due to loss of restraints. Das Ich, der Boden, die Sprache, alle sind, alles, alle sind nicht mehr etwas Gegebenes, sondern etwas, das erst durch das Wagnis das Fortgehen oder auch hineinspringen in die Ungewissheit gefunden werden kann. Wenn das geschieht, ist die Fremdheit des Exils eine Weile lang aufgehoben. Dann aber geht es schon wieder weiter. Zu neuer Freiheit und Fremdheit, zu neuem Wagnis auf der Suche nach dem Ort, dem jedem und keinem gehört. You will probably recognize that this last sentence resonates with his poem Meeting dedicated to his German friend, Bobrovsky, with which I opened my talk by quoting, neither here nor there, I am at home, on my way, in search of the place. No matter the language, at the heart of Hamburger's work was always an in-between space related to his early trauma and exile and unspeakable. But paradoxically, he obviously needed this constant bilingual border crossing in order, in order to deal with his, with his condition. It was his self-healing process, despite his remark in the no man's land variations, that he wrote German like someone walking on crooked, on crutches. He once said about Ceylon that to render his extreme experience as a survivor he began to explore the limits of language by inventing a form of desperate race on the inarticulate. I think this is to some extent true for Hamburger, even though his poetry seems to be less radical and more cautious. His procedure resembles like a circling round a gap or gulf between the languages. Therefore, I would suggest that we can interpret this problem with a concept 
that I took from the Hungarian-French couple of psychoanalysts, Nicholas Abraham and Maria Toro. They argued that every trauma produces its secret crypt, which entombs an unspeakable pain or grief. This sort of traumatic canal is in its essence nameless, unmetaphorical, a species of suffering that must search, however haltingly, for, for expression. Here, I think we can learn from Hamburger why poetry is indispensable to express these traumata. As his example shows, poetry can play an important role in finding perhaps not the right word or the only word, but an elusive word that resonates with other people's experience. Since in Hamburger's view, the poet word was not was, was one that drops like a stone in water, drops into our inner silence, making the sense spread out in a widening circle. For him, this indirect mode of expression was the only way to get closer to the unspeakable. Or to quote another poem entitled Words, because I can't speak what I can't speak, I write. Coming to the end of my talk, I would like to take the opportunity to sum up a few thoughts I have tried to elaborate in this presentation. I would do so with little help of Michael Hamburger, or more precisely with an audio document I found in a German broadcasting archive during my research this summer. In this short extract that you will hear now, recorded on the occasion, of an award ceremony at Tübingen, Hamburger comes back to three key issues I emphasized. First, he mentioned in his opening comment the importance of Hölderlin in his early years in exile. He was his anchor, his figure of identification in a period in which he had a feeling of drowning and heavy sea to, uh, between two coastlines, between a German side he could not leave behind in a British host country that he could not fully adopt as his own yet. At this critical point, the profoundly sensitive Hölderlin became his persona, a mask, which enabled him to express his own feelings of dis discomfort and homelessness. Next, he touches another issue that accompanied him throughout his creative life, the question if there is such a thing as the truth of poetry a truthfulness or urgency that we cannot articulate in simple dialect, direct words. Something that relies on the intrinsic possibilities of poetry. One of the delights of writing poems sad, is that they can surprise and embarrass us. They know, he wrote, what one is and has been and will be, where one has come from and where one is going. Hamburger came from Berlin to the UK in 1933. And this simple fact had the potential to become his fate. But he tackled this traumatic transplantation by inventing his own modes of translation over the abyss of time as a critic, translator, and poet. So did he finally bridge his no man's land of languages that he was forced to discover? I would say no. But by finding ways around, by establishing an almost amicable relationship with his uncanny gulf between languages, he turned his personal world of exile into one of the most remarkable literary attempts to deal with the experiences of war, expulsion, and its long aftermath. And now, hopefully, we can listen to Michael Hamburg. <laughs> Der Übersetzer und Literaturwissenschaftler Michael Hamburger hat heute in Tübingen den Friedrich-Hölderlin-Preis erhalten für seine herausragenden Leistungen bei der Übertragung deutscher Lyrik ins Englische. Mit Michael Hamburger bin ich jetzt telefonisch verbunden. Einen schönen guten Abend und erstmal herzlichen Glückwunsch. Ja, vielen Dank. Herr Hamburger, Sie haben vor allem Hölderlin übersetzt und den Angelsachsen zugänglich gemacht. Was reizte Sie so an Hölderlin? Zuerst war es durch eine Identifizierung mit dem Dichter. Etwas sehr Subjektives. Das hat sich aber dann im Laufe der Jahre geändert, weil ich ja selber Lyriker bin und dann mich hauptsächlich für die Kunst 
Hölderlins interessierte und nicht nur für das Leben und die Person. Und darum hat, hat es sich geändert. Äh, meine erste Hölderlin-Übersetzung war auch eine sehr freie Übertragung, weil ich die Metren der Gedichte nicht wiedergegeben habe und eigentlich diese Metren noch fast gar nicht verstanden habe. Und darum habe ich äh, schon bald angefangen, die ganze Arbeit wieder von Neuem zu machen. Und so ging es immer weiter. Und das habe ich jetzt 50 Jahre, seit ich äh, angefangen habe. Truth of Poetry, Wahrheit der Dichtung, heißt ein Buch, das Sie geschrieben haben. Aber Dichtung ist doch immer Erfindung, Fiktion. Wann ist sie wahr? Ja, das ist eine sehr äh, schwierige und subtile Frage. Und dieses Buch es gibt auch keine äh, einfache Antwort äh, auf diese Frage, aber es geht doch in der Dichtung um Wahrheit. Es geht aber um verschiedene Arten von Wahrheit, zum Beispiel äh, auch subjektive Wahrheit und objektive Arbeit. Und das hängt immer von dem einzelnen Dichter an, äh, wo das Gewicht fällt. Sie mussten in Ihrer Kindheit Deutschland verlassen und sind nach Großbritannien übergesetzt, um Übersetzer zu werden, um Brücken zu bauen zwischen beiden Kulturen. Im Gegensatz zu vielen Exilanten, wie zum Beispiel Tucholsky, haben Sie sich nicht von Ihrer Muttersprache verabschiedet. Was hat Sie nach oder während des Dritten Reiches noch an Deutschland interessiert? Ja, ich habe lange Zeit habe ich das Deutsch fast verloren weil ich als Kind nach äh, England gekommen bin und dann auf die Schule gegangen bin dort. Und die, äh, die Kinder äh, assimilisieren sich sehr schnell. Und äh, eine Zeit lang habe ich fast kein Deutsch mehr gesprochen. Mein Vater starb auch schon, als ich 16 Jahre alt war. Und mu musste dann das äh, Deutsch wieder erlernen auf der Schule und, und der Universität. Ich hatte aber ein Bedürfnis, diese erste Schicht meines Lebens und meines Erlebnisses nicht, nicht ganz äh, zu verlieren. Und darum habe ich auch früh angefangen äh, zu übersetzen. Zur selben Zeit eigentlich, als ich äh, anfing, eigene Gedichte in englischer Sprache zu schreiben. In Südfunk aktuell sprachen wir heute Abend mit Michael Hamburger, der heute in Tübingen mit dem Friedrich-Hölderlin-Preis ausgezeichnet wurde. Vielen Dank für dieses Gespräch und einen schönen Abend noch. Ja, ich danke Ihnen. Is there, is there anything more? That he, that's the end of the... That's it, that's the end. That, 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 that is the end. Yeah. Till that yeah. was such a, that was excellent. That was so interesting and um, very insightful in that regard and very moving also. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm sure that refugees who lack the poetic ability of Hamburger could still identify with what yeah, he's yeah, conveying. Of course, try to be the voice of them. Yes, yes. Thank you very much indeed. We don't have a great deal of time, but if Jane could possibly bear with us for an extra five minutes or so, I'm sure that there are many questions. And I would have to say at this stage that The seminar is being recorded, so if you do not wish to appear in it, please kindly switch off your cameras. Though, of course, you can still keep the sound on and ask questions, um, either by raising your hand or uh, through the chat box or otherwise. Do, do we have any questions, please, or comments, observations? There is one. Tony. Um, I just Tony. wanted, yes. Oh, can I couldn't you... see your hand or any indication. <laughs> a... I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me? I, yes, I just yes, we to... can hear you well. Thank you. I just wanted to um, 
really reiterate what, what Jana said. I thought this was really a, a magnificent presentation um, and the sensitivity to the, uh, the sort of in-between nature of um, Michael Hamburger was, was uh, exemplary, both in, obviously in between languages, but uh, I thought you captured very nicely the sort of in-betweenness of his generation yeah. Um, mm. which, which I think is, a, is actually an important factor in the experience of uh, refugees who came as quite young or very young children. And, um, well, uh, 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 all, I, all I can say is thank you very much, Till, and I wish you all the best for uh, your future plans. Thank you. May I second that? Thank you, Tony. And I think you, you of course, quite right. You remember our discussion, uh, and then you, you mentioned Ken Ambrose. I mean, he, he yeah. has, is a bit the voice of this middle generation. Eh? And he explained exactly this situation of being in between. Yes. Um, I was very glad that you, that you came across a lot of karma as well. I was thinking of the same poem, bilingual, um, which is a, a, a wonderful expression of... Um, uh, of, of precisely that in-between uh, situation. Um, my, Mr. Martin Swales, you had a quick, you put your hand up. Just one comment, uh, a wonderful paper, thank you so much, and bringing Hamburger close to us. One thing I remember about him was that garden he had in Suffolk and the apples. Yeah. And he knew the names of all the apples, and yeah. it was almost like a magic moment in the Garden of Eden. Suddenly, the <laughs> language brought the apples into disclosure. It was quite wonderful. It's not really central to your aspects, which are the more important ones, but it is something that I treasure about him. <laughs> yes, but it is in a way related, isn't it? As far as I know, he even brought uh, continental European sorts of apples to Britain, isn't it? I've never been to the garden, to be honest, but I just heard this this legend that he he, he brought different types of, of apple to apples to Brit different sorts. <laughs> and he knew their names, the names of all the apples. And it was almost an incantation. It wasn't just a label. It somehow brought them into some kind of disclosure. It was wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Axel, you've put your hand up. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, and thank you, Till. A wonderful talk. Um, I uh, I met Michael Hamburger in 1986. We were uh, uh, both invited to speak at the Anglistentag mm. in uh, Kiel, where I had spent 10 years previously. <laughs> uh, I think he had a much better reason to be there than me. Uh, but uh, uh, it was extremely interesting to get to know him. And uh, my work has been on German nature poetry and uh, uh, then environmental poetry. And uh, I found his work particularly interesting. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about his later work, um, whether you feel that apart from this uh, awareness of language, which, which was forced on him by being in the no man's yeah. land between the two languages, <laughs> Uh, whether in some way he was um, mediating by importing uh, some of the uh, characteristics of German nature poetry uh, yeah. into English. Yes, yes, that's a good question. I mean, uh, these nature poems you can also already see, of course, in the Romantic tradition and from Holy and some. And I had the impression that, I mean, uh, just from my German perspective, that his English um, poems became more and more simplistic in a way, coming more and more towards this this uh, uh, quite laconic tradition. She looks very back to 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 Herdelin's, uh, shorter poems. This is that was at least my impression that even in his later years he kept, came closer and closer to, to this sort of poetry. Axel, did you want um, to add something? No, I'm sorry, my wife is speaking on another 
<laughs> oh, so I muted right. myself so you wouldn't be disturbed by that. But thank oh, you very much, Jill. Cool. No, because your the, your hand is still up in the. Yeah, I'll take it down. <laughs> I wouldn't want to cut you short. We should have something. To <laughs> um, okay, that's fine. Is there anyone else who would like to make an observation or to ask a question? You look great. Analysis, please. And then I'm going to say, so don't get it. Perhaps say it again. Thank you for the observation. I can think of a dinner pattern. <laughs> okay, thank you. My husband's bringing them out, so that's good. How are you, Liz? How are you, Liz? I'm good, thank you. I was saying. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Oh, Marietta, sorry. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I understood that quite right. And thank you very much for a very interesting talk and very enjoyable. Um, towards the end, you talked or you quoted Michael Hamburger in connection or um, different, uh, no, in connection with Freiheit and Fremdheit, how the Fremdheit maybe brings about Freiheit. Can you, can you talk a little bit? more about this or have I completely misunderstood that? Margaret, I'll come back to you. You know, when he talks about the Suche nach dem Ort, der jedem und keinem gehört, and in this context, I think, he talks about Fremdheit and Freiheit, like the Fremdheit gives a certain amount of Freiheit in the Sprache oder umgekehrt. Nein, habe ich das nicht ganz mitgekriegt. Till, Till, I think your microphone is off. Uh, as far as I got, the question was about uh, Freiheit and Fremdheit, yeah? Yeah. Freedom and foreignness. So um, I, I, I think the idea was that when you enter this no man's land, you get a bit de detached mm -hmm. from your nation that you belong to, obviously. So you lose something, but you win something. So, yeah. so you get into a space in between where you, the way you're bound up with your nation, with, the, with this legacy and all the things, you, you get a bit, in a way, yeah, it loses this connection in a way. And I think this gives you a certain freedom, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's how I understood it as well, that not being so tied down to one yeah. side. Exactly. And yeah. therefore... Which is an opportunity in a way. Yeah, thank you. Margaret, did you wish to say something? I thought you had your hand up. Me, me. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Like, no, I, I just wanted to say we met Michael in the house of Erich Fried hmm. in the 1960s. And Fried, I think, retained his German, I know he was Austrian, but his yeah. German identity more than Michael uh, in a different he way. Even more than he, yeah. But he was much older, I think, when he came to Britain, wasn't he? He was like 18 already or something. Or oh, 16. maybe, yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. He was a dear friend, anyway. <laughs> no, I remember the apples too. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Uh, before we close, may I just check if it's anyone who wishes to say anything else or to add anything? No. In that case, Till, thank you once again for an excellent presentation. And it's really encouraged me to read his poetry as well. Thank you. I shall be a new <laughs> adherent. And thank you all for attending. And of course, to Jane Lewin at the university, as always, for her very kind and invaluable help. May I just mention before we close, the next seminar is to be given by Catherine Sederberg, whose topic is writing of home and Heimat, German and Austrian refugee diaries.
that's also uh, a Zoom seminar, and it's on the 14th of December.